Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U online instruction. All right, welcome back to the Nano Hub U course, thermal energy at the nanoscale. I'm Tim Fisher, and we are coming toward the end of week five, which is our last week. Uh, we've been talking this week about scattering and transmission, and today we're going to, to talk about electrons. I know that there are many people in the class who come from a, a background of electrical engineering or maybe have just worked on electronic transport, more than phonon transport in the past, and uh, I hope you haven't felt neglected, but today we'll make up for it if you have at least a little bit. Um, I want to talk about electron emission processes, and, and one in particular. Uh, before we go into the details of that, I want to describe the general electron emission processes that exist. This is actually uh, the origins of, of this study. Uh, the study of electron emission go back to the early 1900s, and in fact, Einstein uh, won his Nobel Prize for photo emission, not for, um, not for re uh, general relativity. So... It's, a, it's an important subject, at least uh, at one point in time, uh, people thought very highly of that work. Um, I'm going to talk about here two types of, of electron emission. And the next slide will we'll bring in another one. Uh, but the first is called thermionic emission. So let's imagine that I have a cathode. That's going to be the, the source of the electrons. A cathode that is at some elevated temperature uh, and at the surface of that cathode is the work function, that's phi, and it's a barrier. It keeps the electrons inside for the most part, but if, if the energy of an electron is high enough, it, it can actually uh, exceed that energy barrier and uh, come out of the material uh, in, in a thermionic process. I don't know the roots of the word, um, but you, you might imagine it's therm is from thermal and ionic means charge. So, um, it's a charged particle that emits uh, thermally. The other way that electrons can get out of the material is by tunneling, and that's called field emission. And for tunneling electrons, these are often used in, um, in uh, scanning electron microscopy, for example. If you want a very tight energy range of electrons, you can use a tunneling source for that. We won't talk so much about tunneling electrons, although it's a very interesting subject. But generally speaking, to, to achieve tunneling, you're going to pull the potential down uh, on the anode side to create a narrow barrier. That's the delta that's shown in this in this figure. And um, the, the tunneling probability is a highly exponential function of that barrier width. And that's why you get a, a, very, um, a very tight energy window uh, for the tunneled electrons, whereas the thermionic electrons tend to have a a broader distribution that's really the uh, truncated uh, Fermi Dirac distribution. Here's another slide. We're adding one thing to it. There's thermionic, there's field emission, and then also photo emission. This is where a photon comes in and essentially serves the role of, of thermal energy for thermionic emission, uh, although photo emission can also be used, or, or photonic excitation can be used to enhance field emission because it increases the population of higher energy electrons where the tunneling barrier is smaller. And as we said on the previous slide, the smaller the tun tunneling barrier, uh, the much larger the transmission probability becomes. So today we're going to talk about uh, elect current electrical current flow. Um, and first I, I remind us of the, uh, the expression that we had for electronic heat flux. It's very much like what we did for phonons, except for two important differences. Uh, one is that generally, and this is just by convention, uh, we use an energy integral as opposed to a frequency integral. And the second thing is that uh, for, for fermions, uh, we have a, a finite chemical potential. And so when an electron moves from point A to point B in a material to preserve charge conservation, uh, we uh, another electron comes in, and so we can't just worry only about the energy of the electron that's transporting the heat. We also have to think about what's replacing it, and that's why we have uh, a difference, energy minus the chemical potential mu in our heat flux expression. Okay. 
but everything else is pretty much the same. We have, uh, you know, again, this heat flux is uh, the usual suspects appear here. We have the, the mode density, um, that's a dimensionally dependent thing, M sub DD. Uh, we have that energy term that I discussed before. We have our transmission function, script T, and a difference, a driving difference for, um, for transport that is the difference between the distribution functions. In this case, it's, they are Fermi Dirac distribution functions. And electrical engineers would typically uh, worry first about a, a difference in the, uh, in the chemical potential, mu. We're, we're going to neglect those kinds of effects and just worry about the thermal transport part today. Um, but along with thermal transport, in some cases, you can get a net, you can get a net charge flow and so we, we want to look at the, the electrical current density. Um, current flux in the electrical engineering world, what, what people call heat flux, uh, the, the analogous term is called current density by electrical engineers. That's just J, not J sub Q. And so to calculate that, what we do is we take out the energy moment from our uh, thermal transport or heat flux term above. It, it, when we just want to worry about current density. We don't have an energy weighting of the integral. And then everything else is, is pretty much the same. Um, we just take that one term out, except for we add Q in the numerator of the prefactor because we're now counting charge. So um, that's, that's the, those are the only differences. And that's what we'll calculate today. We're going to look at pure thermionic current flow. So that is without the presence of any electrical biasing, any electrical potential difference. And so our problem in, in uh, electron energy space looks like, like uh, the uh, step function that we have here. We have a hot reservoir at temperature T1 on the left and a chemical potential mu. You can think of that again equivalently as a, as a Fermi level or a Fermi energy. And then when I reach the edge of that hot reservoir, uh, there's a, an energy barrier whose height is the, called the work function phi. And then I have vacuum in this case. It doesn't have to be vacuum here, but, but we'll assume it's, it's a vacuum barrier um, that separates the hot reservoir from the cold reservoir. And on the cold side, again, we have the same chemical potential that we have on the hot side, but the cold reservoir is at a temperature T2 that's, that we'll assume to be very cold. So cold, in fact, that we don't have any uh, electron flow from right to left. Just the, the, the only way we can get current to flow is, is to heat the electrons on the left and have them exceed the energy barrier, go through vacuum, and land uh, in, in the right reservoir. Well, as soon as we kind of are able to, to neglect that right to left current flow, then our current density integral becomes even simpler, where now it's just an integral over energy space of the product of the mode density, the transmission function, and the distribution function of the hot reservoir, T1, because there's nothing coming back in the other direction. And then, of course, we have our prefactor um, multiplying the integral out front. Now we'll make some assumptions about the, the uh, dispersion of the electrons, and we'll do the usual thing and say that we have a parabolic uh, band with, a, with edge E sub C. Uh, we talked about this briefly before. These, these are uh, expressions for the number of modes in the different dimensionalities for a parabolic band model. Uh, we didn't derive these from the basics. We actually pulled these out of uh, Professor Lundstrom's book and his course, his NanoHub U course. Um, but they're very simple and, and should be somewhat familiar. The only complication here is that uh, we do have these heavy side functions. H again is heavy side function um, because we need a reference energy. We can't uh, the way that in, in electrical engineering we uh, there are different choices to make about what the zero energy datum is for for electron energy. But what we'll do is we'll just say the bottom of the conduction band is our zero energy datum, and then that that uh, makes those heavy side functions go away. So. Uh, again, for three dimensions, and that's we'll, we'll focus today on three-dimensional problems um, just for the sake of sim simplicity and for familiarity. We'll also neglect any uh, degeneracy that we, you might have, any band 
degeneracy that might exist. That means that you'd have bands that overlap each other. Um, so our, our number of modes is going to be an important factor like it has been for the last couple of weeks. Um, I really like being able to express a lot of these terms uh, um, in terms of the number of modes. Uh, it has some intuitive foundation to it. If we look at uh, thermionic transmission, we, we need a transmission function, of course, um, and that's not quite so simple. Uh, we have to account for the directionality of a surface uh, in order to calculate the transmission function for this for this problem. And there's a little bit of, of work, some, ge uh, I guess, uh, trigonometry, geometry that one has to do to derive the transmission function for this problem, but the, the complications really arise because the emitter surface is in a plane. Let's say that it's, it's in the XY plane as shown on this image. And so the, the energies of the carriers are actually randomized in space. And so we have to kind of chop off a region of, of the case space where the energy in a particular direction, not that an energy is a scalar quantity, I understand that, but energy associated with momentum in a particular direction is, is I guess, the correct way to say it, um, is, is really the defining feature about whether a, an electron will be able to emit out of a surface or not. And so we have to do a little bit of geometry. Once that's done, uh, and again, we also will neglect uh, quantum effects, which, which can produce uh, uh, some diffraction-like behavior in the, in the uh, transmission function. But uh, we'll neglect those quantum effects for now, which is the typical way that it has been done historically. And those are small effects anyway. Um, we get a transmission function. Again, this is for a three-dimensional emitter meaning that we have a, an area, a, an emitter area on a surface um, being fed by a three-dimensional bulk material, the transmission function can be expressed in terms of the work function, that's phi, that's that energy barrier, the chemical potential, sometimes you'll just substitute the Fermi energy there, um, and then the energy of the carrier. We, we expect this transmission to be very energy dependent, and what we find is that there's no emission when the energy is less than the the vacuum level that we showed before. That's that's just above the uh, the work function. And so for again, this is a scaled energy on the x-axis. For for scaled energy here less than one, we'll have no emission, no transmission at all. That's that's what we would expect. And then the transmission grows. The transmission function grows for energies just above that. But it takes a long time to, to sort of asymptote toward one. And the reason is that even for a, a, a scaled energy of 10, that means that the energy of the electron is 10 times bigger than the sum of the, of the chemical potential and the work function. Um, the reason that it's not, it doesn't go to unity very fast is that you have, again, this randomization. This is really thermal energy. The carriers are randomized in directionality, whereas the emission requires the, the carrier to have energy that's directed in a particular direction. So um, so we have, generally speaking, if we get a little bit above the work function, energy just, a, just above the work function, the transmission goes up fairly quickly and then it sort of levels out and takes its time to get to a, a value of unity um, for, for total transmission. That means that essentially all electrons at that energy level would emit. Well, one thing that we can actually measure in the lab is the energy distribution. So if I, instead of just measuring the total current flow, that's J or current density, if we measure instead the, uh, the integrand of the J integral, that's uh, mathematically speaking, that's the derivative of current density with respect to energy, uh, then we can see that it's, it's a very simple expression. It's simply the product of the mode density transmission function, we just covered those on the last two slides, and the Fermi Dirac distribution. And then of course we have our prefactors as well. When we make that sub substitution, we find uh, the expression that's shown here. Uh, I simply put those factors that we had defined on the previous slides into this one. Um, and then the number of modes, by the way, uh, it was proportional to energy. That's where the E term comes from. 
And what we find is a curve that looks like the one shown here. The dashed line in this case is the theoretical curve. And the symbols, these are diamond symbols, are experimental measurements. We use a, what's something called an electron energy analyzer to make these measurements. And this was done on a, a piece of single crystal tungsten uh, with a work function of about four and a half electron volts. And you see that what happens is the, uh, the intensity of the emission, which is proportional to the current density, um, the energy, the spectral current density, it goes up quickly, kind of just like we, we saw with that transmission function. As soon as you get to energies just above the, the barrier height, uh, then you start to see a rapid increase in transmission. But here, what happens is then we have a tail and the intensity diminishes with higher energies. And the reason for that is what we're really seeing here. This is essentially the tail of the Fermi Dirac distribution, more or less. Um, and so even though we have high transmission probabilities for energies, let's say at five electron volts on this scale, the population of electrons, the, according to the Fermi Dirac statistics, is very low. And so we, we have this, uh, this tailing off of the intensity. And this is a typical shape for a thermionic curve. If we go ahead and calculate that integral, um, we would the calculation of the integral can be done analytically. Uh, we'll produce something called the richardson dushman equation. And so you see here that we have a uh, the current density, again, this is a three-dimensional result, is proportional to temperature squared multiplied by an exponential term that has to do with the work function. So this is actually a, a minus sign in front of the, the uh, work function. And so you'll see that if you have a very high work function, that'll be a large term uh, in, in magnitude, or 1 divided by e to the phi over kt is a, uh, the, the e to the phi over kt is a large term for high work functions, and so you have very little emission. The, the name of the game in thermionic emission sources is to make the work function as small as possible so that you can you can have higher current densities. Um, and typically, uh, the way that it's done is, is to uh, treat the surface. Um, there's some surface treatments that you can do to, to diminish the work function. And typically, you're going to find that metals have work functions of about 5 electron volts. And if you do some surface, um, surface functionalization, you can get that down to 2 or 3. Anything below that's, that's really tough. Um, that prefactor A uh, that just comes from evaluation of the integral is given on this slide. It's a collection of fundamental constants that turns out to be 120 amps per square centimeter per degree Kelvin squared. Uh, we also find that we can locate the point of maximum intensity, um, and that is given here. It's actually at the, the sum of the, of the chemical potential, the work function, plus Kt. So plus the thermal energy, that's where the peak happens. And the full width at half max is also something that you could use. For example, if you made a measurement like this and wanted to know what the temperature of the carriers was, you could use the full width half max that's shown in the, in the, uh, in the graph here. That's the width in energy uh, at a, an intensity of 0.5, a scaled intensity of 0.5. All right, that's it for this lecture. I'll see you next time. That'll be our last lecture of the course next time.